Hey guys, welcome back. Well, I've been out doing some imaging of late after uh, taking off a month for heat and work. And uh, I have a few things I want to share with you. Obviously, it's going to be about focusing because what else would I have to talk about? In particular, I'm interested in temperature compensation as a focus adjustment technique, particularly for my SCT that I'm having so many issues with the, uh, with the focuser staying attached. So that's what we want to talk about a little bit today. Again, this is about the Celestron focuser. Many of you have this focuser. I've got it on my C925. And one of the problems that I have been having, and several of you have been having this problem in one form or another, but it's this plate that attaches onto the back of the SCT with these three small screws. Now I have since replaced I believe two of these screws with longer versions and have put Loctite and I haven't had to replace it uh, yet uh, but I do expect it to work itself loose. What happens is as the focuser uh, moves the knob back and forth it creates side to side forces on these screws which backs them out and once that becomes loose the axis of rotation of the focuser and the axis of rotation of the uh, the OTA are offset and you end up with binding and then you have to detach it and then adjust the screws and reattach it. Okay so that's a problem. It takes a uh, it'll shut down your imaging for a given night and it's just a pain in the neck. So one way to try to at least minimize uh, the number of times that I've got to take off and reattach the focuser is to not rely on the focus algorithm such as the v-curve algorithms that we're all familiar with where the focuser moves back out of focus and then moves forward through and past optimum focus fits a curve to the data points it gets and then goes back to the optimum focus point so that's a lot of focuser movement and back and forth movement that is part of the problem with that I have with these screws staying attached. So I'm trying to avoid that because after all the focus movements we make during a given night are all in one direction and then the next night we have to put the focuser back to where it was roughly speaking the previous night, the start of the previous night and then we go through that cycle again but during a given night there should be no need really to have to move the focuser in the opposite direction it's always one directional and so as an alternative I'd like to use this one-way idea this one-way temperature compensation to move the focuser um, in a in a proportional rate with temperature drop overnight and that way we end up making minimal amount of focus removes and we're only making them in one direction for a given night and so that would help prolong the attachment lifetime of my focuser to the OTA. Now I did talk to uh, our sent uh, Celestron support an email and one of the comment is that they've never heard of such a thing. I don't know, seem to, seem to be quite a few of us experiencing this kind of a problem. Anyway, uh, my objective here is to ultimately end up with some way of doing automated, that means I get to sleep, small focuser movements in one direction during a given imaging session. Ever since I've had the SCT attached pretty much, this is what I, I have set up. I've got my Celestron 925 set up here, the ASI 1600 and the filter wheel and the Celestron off-axis guider all attached here. I've got uh, on my CGEM mount, so this is a, an original CGEM mount. Well, I say original, I suppose there's been some modifications, but it's a it's an earlier model CGEM mount. And I've got the Pegasus Astro Ultimate Power Box attached to the side of the telescope, and the environmental sensor is Velcroed to the back cell under all this mess here. Uh, so it's reading the air temperature from back here. Uh, during the course of, of a night. So I'll, you'll be seeing some data from that environmental sensor and that's where that's coming from. I've also got a little camera down here for live video surveillance so I can watch what's happening uh, to the telescope. That's often uh, been uh, a bit useful uh, occasionally to, to catch a potential cable snag or if I see the telescope going in a direction it's not supposed to be going I can I can stop it. So that's been a uh, that's been fairly useful. And I've added a wind sensor that just gives me real-time instantaneous readout of the wind and direction so if I see some weird behavior in the guiding I can check the wind to see if it's most likely caused by the wind or if I've got something else going on gives me some a hint as to where to start solving that problem but that's the system we're dealing with and talking about here in this video now this is from an earlier video the first uh, the title of that video was first use of the Celestron focuser on my SCT where I went through a number of of uh, focusing studies with the Batonoff mask and this Celestron focuser on my SCT to identify the backlash and identify filter offsets. This is the filter offset 
data that's in that uh, that presentation. I'm not interested in that for our purposes here. The thing that I want to point out mostly is the slope of this line here, which is the Batonoff focus error, which is measured in pixels as a function of focuser position. And then the critical focus zone, the an optimum focus, is about plus and minus one pixel, so a total of two pixels error width uh, across here. And that's, you want to have your uh, focuser set so that you're inside this zone here. Now the important thing we want to pull out for our purposes in this video is the slope of all these lines. Now, each line here corresponds to a filter and they're all behaving identical uh, you know for all intents and purposes. So the slope here is probably identical to within the measurement error of the Batonoff mask and whatnot. Uh, so that's what we want to pull out. This is the uh, Batonoff focus error in pixels per step per focuser, Celestron focuser step. Okay, that's what that number is. And the way we're going to make use of that is by, again, realizing that the focus zone is two pixels error, size, and width, and we take that two pixels, divide it by 0.275, the slope of, well, the average slope of that line, and that tells us that we have seven steps. In other words, if I'm at one end of this focus zone, critical focus zone, and I make seven steps in position, then I can, I will, after the seventh step, I will just be exiting the focus zone, the critical focus zone. So this critical focus zone is about seven steps wide, which basically means that anything that causes focus to shift by roughly five to ten steps is something I want to compensate for to stay within that ideal critical focus zone. Now, the eye may not be able to perceive crossing just out of that critical focus zone as out of focus because our eyes are far less sensitive than these numerical metrics that we rely on, but still, it's a reasonable goal that if any there's any change that causes focus to shift five steps, ten steps, then that's something I want to do in order to keep up with focus throughout the night. Well, in the past four nights, I've been doing some imaging, and what you're seeing here is the outside temperature based on the Pegasus Astro uh, PowerBox environmental sensor that it records, and then you can save it off as a CSV file for plotting, which is what I've done here. And so each of these four nights has been basically identical. Uh, it starts off hot, uh, and it ends up warm at the end of the, the time. The imaging period, and by the way, the zero here corresponds to 9 o'clock at night or 2100. So I'm starting imaging roughly around 930 and going to about 530 during this period. And at each one of these areas, these plotting symbols here, those are instances when I would go outside, put on the Batonoff mask, and actually do the focusing to, to ensure that we were within that critical focus zone. And so obviously I would start off the imaging session with a Batonoff mask uh, measurement. Then I would go to do some imaging on M101 to pick up some HA data, which I didn't get the last time I was out with the scope. And then after about an hour, I would come back and do more, uh, do another round of Batonoff focusing and swing over to M16 and do some imaging on that for several hours. And then I would come in and uh, slew to another star, do uh, more focusing sometimes an intermediate step here while doing M16, and uh, focus for uh, doing the crescent nebula for the remainder of the night. And then on two of those days, I was fairly industrious and able to uh, wake up early enough while it was still dark enough to do one last focus, even though I wasn't doing any imaging after that. It does give me a nice endpoint uh, for these this long baseline of measurement here throughout the night. So that's all of the data from uh, four nights, all of the temperature data from four nights of observing. And if you plot a line to that, you can see we have an average temperature drop of about 0.57 degrees C per hour. And of course, that can change throughout the year. And I went back through recent, ever since I've had the power box, which hasn't been a year yet. Went back to the December data and I had a couple of nights where I was doing imaging kind of like this and it was about 0.55 degrees C per hour. In May it was about twice that, a 1.11 degrees C per hour. So you're going to be making more adjustments in May than I would be in December or August. But our real objective here is to take this data and we have the of course, we have the focuser position after adjusting the focus with the Batonoff mask, but we also have the temperature. I want to use that data to determine the, the sensitivity of this SCT2 temperature variation and determine ultimately how often and by how much I should be making adjustments to the focus.
So if we look plot that data from those batten off focus points on the previous chart, this is what we get. All right, on the horizontal axis, we have the temperature that the focus adjustments were made at, and we have the final focuser position when we achieved focus within that uh, Batonoff critical focus zone uh, range of that plus or minus two pixels. And uh, it's actually remarkably consistent. I'm actually pretty uh, surprised and impressed by that. Now, I do expect a linear trend here, and we do get a best fit line of 23 steps per degree C of, of adjustment, but we expect a line because the focus shifts in part because the aluminum tube is shrinking as the the temperature is dropping and that that formula is a very simple one that relates the change in length of the aluminum tube the OTA to uh, the uh, coefficient of thermal expansion or contraction times the original length of the tube times the change in temperature and of course if you have twice the change in temperature you get twice the change in length and so because delta t here is linear there's not a square it's not a square root it's just linear we expect this to be a line and it is and that also tells us there's no other significant uh, additional effect or effects that are uh, upsetting this basic relationship between focus and temperature, which means temperature compensation as an open loop method of simply making adjustments based on temperature uh, is, a, is a perfectly viable option for this telescope. Now, uh, I say this is linear uh, with the, the change in temperature for a reflector. You got to be careful. The, uh, a reflector is different from a refractor in more ways than one, uh, not the least of which is uh, the temperature change will affect the length of a reflector's tube. But in a reflector, the, the glass, the index of refraction in glass is also highly uh, temperature dependent. Now, the end effect may be you have two effects going on, and they ultimately both uh, yield roughly linear behavior. That may that probably is true. The the important point is that the index of refraction is a is maybe the primary driver for change of focus in a refractor. Whereas in a reflector, of course, there is no refraction, no significant level of refraction, and so we don't have to worry about that. Now, what this also says in the case of a an, an SCT like this, a reflector, uh, could be a, a Newtonian a carbon fiber tube would be very beneficial. Carbon fiber has about one tenth the uh, the coefficient of thermal expansion as aluminum and so I'm seeing about a hundred step difference throughout the night if you had a carbon fiber tube that change would be 10 steps in other words it, it's almost not worth making an adjustment for you could get through the entire night without making an adjustment if you had a carbon fiber OTA for an SCT or Newtonian uh, but I don't. I have the aluminum, so I'm getting a s relatively, on the scale, significant amount of contraction and therefore required focus adjustment. The only important point to take away from that is that we have this measurement which says 23 steps per degree C is what we have to do to to keep up with the thermal contraction. Uh, but we also can see that its uh, linear relationship is consistent from night to night and should uh, should be consistent from uh, year round. So it's a it should be a reliable means of adjusting the uh, focus of the SCT. And there are ways of doing that. Astrophotography tool does provide a temperature compensation option in here, which you can check. Uh, I don't check the real-time compensation uh, because that means it's going to make focus adjustments while in the process of collective imaging. Uh, now, what I've noticed is that when I make a focus adjustment, it will the torque applied to the tube will cause it to move enough that the PhD2 feels like it's got to bring the guide star back into alignment. And so there is this little period after you uh, do a little focus adjustment that it takes some time for the scope to regain uh, its tracking on the guide star. And so that, that by not checking that, it only applies the correction in between images. Uh, in this case, I would put in, uh, I think it would be a minus 23 steps per degree change. And this tells it how many readings uh, to take and then to how many averages uh, to, to collect before it decides to make an adjustment. And it makes adjustment uh, based on whatever it comes up with from each of those averages at this uh, base rate of 23 steps per degree change. Uh, this tells you, and this is very looks very promising, that uh, you can your temperature source can either be the the uh, the focuser if you have a focuser with a temperature sensor like my uh, 
Pegasus Astro Focus Cube 2. It comes with a, a temperature sensor, which is what I use when I'm using the refractor. Uh, however, uh, in, the, in, my, uh, in the Celestron Focuser case, there is no temperature sensor, so you'd have to use the external sensor. The problem is uh, Astrophotography Tool does not recognize the ultimate power box environmental sensor as an external sensor, even though the temperature is right there. It could conceivably make use of it, but it doesn't. And so because that temperature sensor is not available, I can't make use of temperature compensation. Even though the code, the program is set up to, to permit it, I can't make use of it with the Celestron Focuser because I don't, and because APT does not recognize this particular uh, temperature sensor. So that's one little trip up. So in summary, uh, the aluminum tube, in my case a C9.25, uh, Smith Cassegrain is very foc very sensitive to temperature variation, and I've measured that uh, fairly consistently at 23 steps per degree C. Which 23 steps? That's about three times the width of the critical focus zone per degree C. So you definitely be want to be making adjustments uh, in the sub degree change uh, region. Probably want to make adjustments about every 0.2 degrees. C in temperature change in order to not get too far out of the critical focus zone. And if the air temperature changes as it has for me uh, in at least in August at 0.57 degrees C per hour, I've got to adjust focus every 20 minutes. Uh, now in May, according to the data I have, when it was twice this range of temperature drop, I'd have to adjust focus every 10 minutes to keep up with the change in length of the aluminum tube. So that's quite a bit of readjustment, especially if you're relying on the typical v-curve autofocus algorithms that may take 10 minutes per run to do an autofocus. If I was doing that with past a uh, few days of imaging, I'd lose one third of my imaging time to autofocusing, and that seems kind of excessive. Now, I will say that staying within the critical focus zone is is ideal. You may have good enough focus if you slip outside of that, so maybe uh, making adjusting the focus every 40 minutes, for example, might be adequate. But you might have to do every 20 minutes when the temperature is dropping much faster, again, as it did for me in May when it was twice this value. So the point is, these focus algorithms that take a long, relatively a long time to run, if you're executing them over and over and over again, you're losing quite a bit of time in, in your imaging night trying to keep up, when in fact there is a very simple way to do it with temperature compensation as long as your system is behaving as linearly, as consistently as this SCT apparently is. So the solution for me would be to use the temperature compensation uh, whenever delta T changes by 0.2 degrees, then adjust the uh, focus for position. Again, that focus adjustment is always going to be in one direction. Um, and the focus adjustment can be done between images, so there's no actual loss of time during, during, the, uh, during the refocusing. You just, it's just a subtle, small movement in between images You know, every 15 minutes or so is about what that would come to. And then, if you wanted to, uh, I'd be inclined to just use the temperature compensation throughout the night and see how that worked. But if you wanted to, you could then uh, cut back on the amount of V-curve autofocus uh, routines that you perform, say every two hours or so, just to prevent drift or compensate for unknown effects that you weren't counting on, just to, to make keep everything honest. So that would at least cut down on the number of V-curve autofocus and the, the lost time to the V-curve autofocus. It would also for me, who's one concerned about the uh, mechanically exercising my my focuser on the back of the SCT, it would also reduce the number of back and forth movements. Uh, but the problems, of course, are that the Celestron focuser doesn't have a temperature sensor, and Astrophotography Tool does not recognize the Pegasus Astro environmental sensor, and so I have no way of getting temperature into APT's temperature compensation an algorithm, and Nina, the last time I checked, uh, does does recognize the, the ultimate power box and does bring in the temperature, but it does not make the temperature available to the focuser. Uh, now, I don't know if that's still true. They've had a final release of version 1.10, and so maybe that's fixed, but I doubt that's been a high priority, so I suspect this is still a problem. And uh, so, yeah, well, this temperature compensation is a very viable option for keeping focus, keeping in focus throughout the night and for getting some sleep throughout the night. Uh, it doesn't seem to be possible at the minute. Oh well. Clear skies. I'll talk to you guys later.